Hey guys, it's Tuesday, and what better day than today to talk about chain matrix multiplication and dynamic programming solution for it. So, let's jump right into it. There's a fair amount to cover. We're going to talk about the theory about it, and um, how it works, why it works, the algorithm itself. Then in the next video, we'll do a couple examples. So if you just want to see examples, go to the next video. If you care about how it works and you want some more intuition, then maybe spend 10 minutes here. Okay? So, let's jump right in. Let's assume that we have four matrices that we want to multiply together in a chain. Okay? And they can have dimensions that I've written down before. Right here. Good to have notes. This, uh, a will have 6 by 3, B will have 3 by 1, C will have 1 by 3, and D will have 3 by 8. So, before we go any further with this, just in case anybody's forgotten some stuff from linear algebra, we're going to just quickly go over that. First off, matrix multiplication, while associative, does not share uh, commutativity with real number multiplication. With real numbers, you know, 4 times 6 is the same thing as 6 times 4. But with matrices, A times B is not the same as B times A. You will not get the same product matrix, and often it won't even work. So that's that out of the way. It's not commutative, but it is associative, so you can say something like A times C times D is, uh, well, that wouldn't, well, pretend that it would work. Uh, <laughs> is the same thing as saying A, C, D, where you multiply the product of C and D by A. Same thing. As long as you're not changing the order, you're not permuting anybody, you're good to go. Furthermore, uh, we're going to keep this one over here, because it's an important rule. Multiplying an M by N matrix by an N by P matrix yields an M by P product matrix. And in terms of the number of multiplications you have to do in order to multiply these two together, the total cost in terms of multiplications is m times n times p. So m times n times p. And that's going to come in handy later on. So the question is, is there an order of parenthesization that costs less than the other one? So obviously, if you're looking at something like this, if you have some set of matrices, there's any number of ways that we could, you know, permute the parentheses. We can put them like around B and C, and then start with that, and then multiply A and B in, and then we can start with A and B, and this to C and D. Any number of ways, but what we're trying to figure out is, is there one specific way that is cheapest? Or maybe there's some set of ways that are all the cheapest. To test it out, just to try to like see an example of how we do it, how we even check for that in the first place, let's just try a couple random examples. We'll do A times B times C times D. And then we'll try the simpler one, AB times CD. And we're looking at cost of multiplications. We don't care about what's actually in the matrices. We're above and beyond caring about what's actually going on inside the product matrix or anything like that. We only care about dimensions and cost. How much space does it take and how much time does it take? So we start with B times C. So we have M by N by P multiplications. 3 by 1 is 3 times 3 is 9 multiplications. And it yields an M by P product matrix. 3 by 3. Okay, so that's that. Now we have the cost of multiplying the product matrix by D. So we have 3 by 3 is 9 times 8 is 72. And that yields a 3 by 8 product matrix. Sorry, I got confused. I was thinking that we were doing this differently, but this does work. 6 by 3 by 3 by 8 does in fact work. So, now we're going to multiply A into that product matrix. So we have 6 by 3 into 3 by 8. 6 times 3 is 18, times 8 is, I think, 144, I think. So, 
put them all together and whatever you get, we have, let's say this is 140 plus 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 210, 219, about 200 and about, round about 223. Basic arithmetic is for basic people. This is about what it is. But down here, we have a by b, which is 6 times 3 is 18, times 1 is 18, and yields a 6 by 1 matrix, plus the cost of c and d, 1 by 3 by 8 is 24, and yields a 1 by 8. And then we have 6 by 1 by 8. We have 6 by 1 and 6 times 8 is, I think, 48, something like that. So we have 40, 50, 60, 70, 86, 90, I think, something like that. So obviously this is much cheaper than this ordering. This ordering beats this ordering by more than half. So we can see right away that we can save time moving parentheses around. The question though is how do we find the optimal ordering of parentheses? Because that may not have even been the optimal ordering. There were any number that I could have gone with that would have done any possible permutation you can imagine, parentheses. So how do we find it? So say we have a set of matrices denoted maybe A1 times A2, times all the way up to an, where they have dimensions in general, they'll just work. We'll say it's m of n minus 1 for whatever n is by mn. So like matrix 1 would have m0 by m1, matrix 2 would have m1 by m2, and so on and so forth, all the way up to mn1 minus n, uh, mn1 m minus 1 by mn. And we'd like to know the cheapest way of doing this. Well, if you think about it a little differently, if it, uh, I think it helps to think about it in terms of binary trees. So, if you recognize that each possible permutation of parentheses corresponds directly to a binary tree, it helps, in, it helps to think about how to solve the problem more quickly. So let's go back to the original example that we had. A times the product of B and C times d. This corresponds directly to a binary tree, where each subproblem represents a subtree, and each subtree is a subset of subproblems in the overall computation that we're doing. So we start from the root, and each blank node, let's call it uh, a product, right? So we're having something multiplied together. A is being multiplied by all of this. So A is going to be over here by itself, multiplied in to another product of two matrices, right? With D on the right. And on the left, D is being multiplied by another product of two matrices, B and C. So what we'd like to do is find the version of this tree that is the cheapest, that costs the less, that costs the least. So how would we do that? Well, the intuitive, brute force way to do it would just be, well, generate every possible tree and just find the cheapest one. Iterate through them all until you find the cheapest one. Which would require iterating through every single tree once. The problem is that as n increases, as the size of the set of matrices increases, the number of possible permutations and the number of possible trees increases exponentially in terms of n. So you have n in the exponent. So this is something that could take weeks, months to do. It's not practical to do it that way. But if we think about it a little bit differently, you notice that these trees are suggestive of something else about the problem. We're looking for the optimal version of the problem, right? Let's, so let's assume that this is optimal, right? This is the optimal tree, and therefore this is the optimal equation. If the tree is optimal, 
then all of its subtrees must also be optimal. Right? And that's the same thing as saying that if the equation is optimal, then every sub-equation must be optimal because every subtree corresponds to a sub-equation, a sub-problem, a sub-multiplication, whatever you want to call it. So that means that this is the optimal way of doing this. BC is obviously the optimal way of multiplying BC because you can't permute. But then BCD, this is the optimal way. And then A times that product is the optimal way. And all the way up to the top. So, how do we find that? Well, let's say that we've got a subtree, right? Let's take just some subtree from our optimal tree. What's it doing? Well, it's going to be multiplying a subset of matrices 1 through n, right? Into a product to be worked up the tree. So, it's going to be working on a subset of matrices. We'll denote it AI multiplied up to AJ. Right? That's what he's doing. Where, since we're dealing with 1 through N, we'll say that 1 is less than or equal to I. Ooh, that's a J. 1 is less than or equal to I. That would have confused things. It is less than or equal to J, which is less than or equal to N. And we would like to figure out what's going on here. If this is working on I through J, then the first branch of this subtree, however deep you want to imagine it goes, the first branch is going to be splitting this equation into two. Right? Not necessarily equal halves, but into two. So on the left-hand side, it'll be working from the left-hand side, AI, up to some a k, where k is in between i and j. And that's where it'll cut off. On the right hand side, it'll pick up right where the left hand side left off, from a of k plus 1 up to a of not n, but j. So then we can write the total cost of computing a subtree as, say, cost of multiplying i through j being equal to the minimum cost of, and it's a recursive function, cost i through k plus, and this is reminiscent of what we were doing before in the example with the matrices in the beginning, we start with i through k, multiply them together, plus the cost of k plus 1 through j, plus, remember the last step in the second example, the a, b, c, d, we multiply these together, multiply these together, and then we added the cost of multiplying them together, plus the cost of combining them, right? So plus the cost of combining, which will be going from the index, we know we have m, n, p for the cost, so the indexes will be m, n minus 1 by m of k by m of n. And that's how we'll think about it. I'll put this on the board when we do the video with the examples, it'll help you to see it. But hopefully this gives you some intuition for how the algorithm is working and why it's working. As we'll see when we do the video with the examples, this equation corresponds directly to a very simple table of values that you can just draw up, and I'll show you how to do it. And the trick here is that originally we were looking at a problem that was exponential in terms of its own input. This equation allows us to solve the problem with an upper bound of n cubed, which is pretty astonishingly fast, considering how big this problem is. We have a guaranteed upper bound of n cubed. It's still not very fast, but it's extraordinarily fast compared to the alternative. So yeah, that'll do it for the theory, for the algorithm of exactly why it works and how it works. Um, in the next video, we'll run through some examples, and hopefully it'll feel more concrete for you, having this as a background. All right, stay classy, guys. See you next time.